Our next speaker is Olivia Chang uh, from the United States. Uh, as a re research and program manager at Pangea, Olivia uh, supports research activities to address key issues in HIV prevention, uh, care and treatment for most at-risk populations domestically and internationally. And uh, the title of Olivia's talk is Risk Factors Associated with HCV Infection and Prevalence of HIV HCV co-infection among people who inject drugs receiving medication-assisted treatment in Dara Salam, Tanzania. Thank, Thank you. you. And you can tell I tried to shorten that on this PowerPoint slide. <laughs> so just a brief background. Um, I'll be giving kind of an introduction to the emergence of drug use in East Africa, providing study methods, some findings, and then tying everything together with conclusions. So East Africa became an important stop along international drug trafficking routes starting in the late, or sorry, mid-1980s into the early 1990s. While it was originally intended to be a stop along drug trafficking routes, it quickly transitioned into a point of consumption. The UNODC estimates approximately 533,000 opiate users living in East Africa today. In Tanzania, injection drug use, primarily of heroin, has become widespread through Dar es Salaam, which is the country's largest city. Um, Dar es Salaam is also home to Tanzania's largest maritime port, which handles about 95% of the country's international trade. Recent estimates indicate approximately 30 to 50,000 people who inject drugs, or PWID, in the country, and about half of these reside in Dar es Salaam. When we compare known HIV prevalence in the general population in the city, it's about 7%, compared to estimates between 35 and 50% among PWID. Prevalence estimates are a little bit harder to come by for hepatitis C, but range between 28 and 76% among PWID in the city. To put this in perspective, um, a study among healthy blood donors at the National Hospital in the city HCV prevalence was found to be 1.5% among blood donors. So in 2010, the Tanzanian AIDS Prevention Program was launched to provide outreach services through mobile units and four community-based storefronts to people who inject drugs. Earlier that year, the Ministry of Health and Social Welfare, in coordination with the Drug Control Commission, began plans for the provision of opioid substitution therapy. This led to the launch of the first publicly funded methadone clinic on the mainland of Sub-Saharan Africa in February of 2011 at Muhambili National Hospital. The program continues to expand with the second and third clinics opening at regional hospitals in September of 2012 and April of 2014. And as of today, a little bit over than six, a little more than 1,600 people have been initiated on methadone maintenance. So we were interested in taking a look at HCV prevalence and also predictor, predictors or risk factors for infection. We have a cross-sectional study design that utilizes the routine programmatic and clinical monitoring data collected at the clinic. Our study population included clients who were enrolled in methadone between February 2011 and January 2013 at Muhambili National Hospital, which was that first pilot site. Provider-initiated testing and counseling for HIV and HCV is provided at enrollment as well as at routine follow-up periods. And leakage to care and treatment is provided for people living with HIV and supportive care is provided for those who are testing positive for HCV. Some of the covariates that we were interested in at baseline were demographics such as age, gender, marriage status, sexual related and injection related risk factors, mental health history including depression and anxiety, legal and criminal history, so history of arrest, and then history of physical or sexual abuse. Our outcomes, there's an analysis around HCV monoinfection as well as HIV HCV co-infection. And prevalence estimates are provided as percentages with 95% confidence intervals. And binomial regression was used to estimate the adjusted risk ratios for factors associated with infection. During our study period, nearly 630 clients were enrolled in methadone and approximately 80% agreed to be screened for hepatitis C. 
The median, year, the median age at baseline was 33. 7% of our clients were female. The median years of heroin use, including injection and or smoking, was 10 years and two-thirds reported having primary education or less. For sexual risk behaviors within six months of enrollment, 20% reported having multiple sex partners, and 40% reported no or inconsistent condom use. In terms of injection-related risk behaviors, 7% of our cohort reported practicing, ever practicing flash blood. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with that term, it's an emerging practice in East Africa in which someone injects themselves with blood from another person who has recently injected heroin. 17% reported sharing needles and or other injection equipment at last injection. And about a third reported combining heroin with alcohol, cocaine, and or benzodiazepine. So HCV prevalence among our cohort at the methadone clinic is 57%. When we take a look at risk factors associated with HCV seropositivity, you can see that flash blood, sharing needles and or other equipment at last injection, and ever being arrested are all associated with increased likelihood of HCV infection. Examining HIV HCV co-infection, a smaller proportion, 66% of clients, agreed to be tested for HIV and HCV. Something that we find at our clinic is that clients are sometimes more willing to be tested for hepatitis than they are for HIV due to stigma. Overall, we see a prevalence of 36% for co-infection. But if you examine this a little closer, among those who are living with HIV, HCV co-infection is nearly 90%. Again, looking at the risks associated with HIV, HCV co-infection, unsurprisingly, flash blood, as well as sharing needles or other equipment are associated with increased likelihood of co-infection. But something to point out is that females were nearly twice as likely than their male counterparts to be living with both HIV and HCV. So some, some conclusions. First, I think the first one is not um, news. We know that risky injection practices drive transmission of bloodborne infections. What's unique to East Africa is the practice of flash blood puts people who inject drugs at even higher risk of bloodborne infections. Second, PWID, particularly women, have a disproportionate burden of disease and are also harder to reach. In Dar es Salaam, we know that approximately 85% of females who inject drugs are also engaging in sex work. And due to experiences of violence that drive women out of shared injection venues and into insular, more hidden communities, this makes it complicated for the delivery of risk reduction services and also hampers the willingness of women to access services. And lastly, while the program has steadily increased its coverage of enrolling people who inject drugs into methadone, 1,600 accounts for only 10% or less of the estimated 15 to 20,000 people who inject drugs that reside in Dar es Salaam. So therefore, we think current coverage of needle and syringe exchange programs, as well as opioid substitution therapy, is inadequate and scale-up is urgently needed. But kind of keeping to the theme of this um, session, how do we respond? So hepatitis C is more curable than ever now. And while Tanzania has strengthened its capacity to test for hep C, it doesn't currently have the capacity to treat and manage the disease for those living with it. So how can we use what we know now and how, what we have more importantly, and how can we respond more immediately? So you guys are probably familiar with the term low hanging fruit. Maybe that's a US thing. Um, in terms of caring for PWID, harm reduction programs, including needle and syringe exchange, as well as methadone maintenance programs, need scale up. For the three sites operating in Dar es Salaam, they have the capacity of reaching at least 1,000 clients each, but until we lower the threshold for patients to come into care, we won't reach those that are most at need. 
So lowering the threshold of programs will attract a higher volume of clients and allow us to conduct primary HIV and HCV prevention. In addition, programs providing outreach and service delivery can scale up testing and counseling, condom distribution, as well as information, education, and communication. And for those who do test positive for HCV, we should be providing behavioral change communication or intervention so that they can manage the disease. We see from our data that females are, more than, are nearly twice as likely than their male counterparts to be co-infected with HIV and HCV. So we urgently need to reach this female population. In Dar es Salaam, the program has started to plan for female-specific clinic hours, as well as female-specific methadone dosing windows so that the females don't have to interact with the males if they don't want to. In addition, they've scaled up with hiring additional female peer outreach workers as well as lowering the threshold at the second clinic, where women, regardless of if they're a smoker or injector, can come the day of and start methadone. In addition, universal hep A or B immunization is something we can think of in the future. And then hepatitis C viral monitoring can not only help us distinguish between current and past infection, but can also help plan for HCV treatment when it is available. On the research and policy side, you notice that our prevalence estimates range anywhere between 28 to 76 percent. So more accurate prevalence estimates are certainly needed for us to know the scope of what we have. Genotyping can help us understand the predominant genotypes in the region so we can plan for hepatitis C treatment. And treatment for co-infections such as HIV, TB, malaria can complicate drug measurements. So drug interaction studies are still needed and subsequently treatment simplification and optimization are also needed. And with all these in place, we also need affordable and equal access to treatment for hepatitis C. At the root of all these systems, we need, in, we need implementation improvements. Strengthening monitoring and evaluation systems, training healthcare workers, and decentralizing and integrating services will be vital to reaching key populations. And lastly, essential to all these components is advocacy to catalyze change around hepatitis C. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge my colleagues, um, as well as the clients, providers, and program managers at our methadone clinics. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Really insightful presentation on uh, the situation in Tanzania.